We're here with Pat Hellman with the University of Minnesota Extension. What he's going to do is he's going to just show us on a model some of the things that they've worked with in their cold climate research, um, issues with basement insulation, water transfer, and things like that. So, Pat, if you could kind of show us some things we need to be concerned about and think about. All right. Yeah, great, Carl. Obviously, below grade heat loss is a big deal. Uh, it's important that we do insulate our basements, but while we insulate them, we have to pay attention to moisture and moisture issues. So let's kind of go through some of the basics of how heat and moisture moves through foundations, and then we'll move into some of the strategies for managing that. Okay. The interesting piece of foundations is once we're down below grade, it really changes everything. I think many of us are familiar with what happens above grade, but below grade, the heat loss is always outward. The indoor temperature is always warmer than the ground temperature. And the vapor transport is just the opposite. The vapor pressure is nearly always greater outdoors than indoors, and so the vapor will be traveling inward. Now we contrast that to either the piece that's above grade or above grade walls where we're more familiar with in the winter heat loss is out and in the summer heat loss is in. In the winter the vapor transport is generally out and in the summer it's generally in. The whole point of this is, is that when we start thinking about foundation strategies we've got to pay attention not only to heat transfer and vapor transport but the difference between what's happening up here and down here. Clearly what really works best is to understand the moisture flows that are associated with the foundation wall, make sure we have those fully under control, then we'll come back to how we manage the thermal heat, uh, or heat, the thermal part of it or the heat transfer part. So in moisture transport there's basically liquid and vapor. In the foundation, liquid transport could be bulk water that's coming into the wall from above grade or down through the grade line getting into the wall system, leaking through cracks or crevices or the block core systems and wetting this wall what we call bulk water. A bigger challenge, one of the perhaps biggest challenges in foundation walls is capillary wicking that starts in the damp soil where it will always be damp of course because it's below your drain tile. That dampness can wick up into the bottom of the foundation. That's capillary wicking or capillary action. So it's liquid water moving through the pores through capillary suction. So those are our two liquids. The vapor will transport in two ways, either with air, so if we have moist air in the soil and we draw that in or draw it up from below, that's heavily humidity laden uh, air, if you will, that could get into our system in some fashion. And then the second one is vapor diffusion, always going from a higher vapor pressure to a lower vapor pressure. As we talked about earlier, in the soil, the soil gas or the soil pore space is always going to be 100% relative humidity. Now it might be chilly or a little cool, but it's going to be at a pretty high relative humidity and generally a pretty high vapor pressure with respect to our indoor air. So that's why this below grade piece is almost always having vapor pressure pointed in this direction. Above grade again, in the winter, our indoor conditions in colder climates tend to be a higher vapor pressure than outdoors. The vapor will want to go in this direction. In the summer when it's hot and humid and we might be air conditioning or the basement is cool, the vapor pressure is generally greater up here and moving inward. So that starts to inform where we want to put our insulation, where we want to put our vapor retarders and moisture management strategies so we get good performance out of our foundation, foundation insulation system. The preferred choice is to put the insulation and the water management on the outside. So we'll put on a waterproofing membrane of some type. It could be spray on, roll on. It could be a membrane that gets, a peel and stick membrane that gets placed. But we want to stop all opportunity for bulk water to get in and saturate the foundation. Most of those systems are also vapor retarders. And that's also to our advantage. Not only will it slow up vapor transport inward in the summer up here, it's going to slow down the continuous vapor drive from outdoors to indoors below grade. Next, we put the insulation on the outside of that. Not only does it protect our waterproofing membrane or coatings, that thermal insulation is going to keep this entire assembly at a very high temperature, almost room temperature, so any moisture that would accumulate in any way, shape, or form here can rapidly dry to the inside. It will keep the wall warm. It obviously will reduce the heat loss to the outdoors, but it will also give us drying potential to the indoors. One other area that we have to take care of is this capillary break. So this is a liquid water management strategy again where we put a capillary break between the footing and the foundation to prevent that upward wicking. Now you can see in this scenario, if we got a little wicking, it wouldn't be the end of the world because it could readily dry to the inside. But that's a moisture load in the house we just don't need. So again, preferably we have this. 
We'll talk later about other techniques where we're on the inside where this capillary break is not just a good idea, it's essential or the system can't work. Also bear in mind there's an important connection between your foundation and your rim joist. And what we've found through our research is if you go out and try to predict what the moisture content of this rim is, and you put into the model based on the research we've done at Cloquet and our foundation test facility, the moisture that's in the building, the moisture that's outside, the moisture contents of the foundation, and try to predict what the moisture content is this location, the best predictor of the moisture content of this is the moisture content of your foundation. And what that tells you is there's a, a very tight connection Moisture connection, vapor could be potentially even capillary liquid water, but generally it's a vapor connection that if we insulate this in a such a way and allow this vapor to transport from here to here, we're going to get a huge buildup of moisture in this rim assembly, especially if it's insulated in a manner like this with a bat and perhaps air sealed to the inside. Made even worse, if we insulate the entire inside, this is going to be cold and see all of that moisture and that's not a good situation. So part of this is always think about the foundation, but don't forget about how you're gonna transition up into the rim joist assembly. The preference would be here, likewise, move the uh, rim assembly in, continue the rigid insulation outboard, and now you'll have a nice warm rim. Again, if there's any vapor or moisture in this assembly, it will dry readily to the inside, to the building harmlessly, and the rim will stay nice and warm and dry as well. So again, just, the exterior insulation is really benefiting the foundation. It gives the opportunity to continue over the rim joist to benefit the rim joist. It really just takes care of a lot of things where you have good thermal control, good vapor control in a single plane, and the ability to keep the entire assembly warm and dry to the inside. Many times we see the desire or, or drive to insulate the foundation on the inside. While it can be done, it really requires perfection. There just has to be perfect moisture control on the wall from below, from outside. There has to be perfect vapor control from inside to out, from outside to in. And we have to have a perfectly airtight system again so we don't have moisture from the indoors getting to this cold upper surface in the winter. We don't have moisture from the soil or soil gases coming up into our assembly from below. So this, this is very problematic and quite frankly a very risky insulation practice if we don't have ideal and perfect control of our moisture in our foundation assembly. That's tough to do on new construction. It's virtually impossible to assure that on existing homes. So the challenges are when we insulate the inside, uh, and typically we'd, we wouldn't use a bat system, but I'm just demonstrating this. What happens is we have to stop the vapor transport outward to hit this cold surface in the winter, or we're gonna have condensation buildup, of course, on the cold foundation. So we have to have a vapor retarder. We have to have an air barrier to prevent that from occurring. But as you recall down here, this vapor is always coming inboard. And it's coming inboard up here in the summer at a pretty rapid rate if it's wet from a rain or hot uh, sun driving on this wet foundation. That inboard vapor wants to build up or accumulate in this thermal insulation system. So again, we would have to add to the backside some moisture management for the thermal insulation to prevent that moisture from coming in and collecting on the inboard surface, which is now our cool surface, in the summer. Made especially worse because of cool basements, or even worse with air conditioning, this becomes a cool collection surface. So this is a very problematic wall, requires protection on both sides, uh, and that's very, very challenging and difficult to do. Even more so challenging here is, one could imagine if some reason you have a plumbing event, a toilet overflows, a washing hose uh, fails, or a sink plugs up, or a flood perhaps, or any water event that were to happen in the basement starts to wet this, this whole assembly has to be removed to get it dried out satisfactorily. Not only do you have to remove the wet insulation, you have to remove the assembly to dry out any wicking and water uptake that's been done by behind in the foundation. So it's another reason why this is risky because if something were to happen in the future, it could be a very expensive retrofit or replacement required to bring this system back, get it dried out, and, and come back with some, a, a new interior approach. So one of the thoughts is, are there ways to improve this interior to work? And there are ways, there are techniques that help. One that's been looked at is basically inserting a different type of insulation in behind this entire system, I just have a short piece here, that would change the conditions here from a moisture perspective that would help this work better again from a durability or moisture management 
and it also would add some additional thermal insulation. So what this does here is a couple things. It starts to warm up the first condensing surface, gets it, moves it away from the cold foundation wall in the winter, this top side being cold, so that we have some protection against condensation in the winter. The second thing it does is it acts as its own vapor retarder so that any moisture that wants to come in above grade in the summer or down below grade virtually year round, this is going to slow that moisture transport up and prevent it from getting into your next insulation layer. This in a sense would replace the back film that's on here to protect your insulation. Some would even argue that if we can build this airtight without polyethylene perhaps, we don't, this is better than we need from a moisture vapor protection in the winter and it is potentially a trap of vapor in other instances, we might actually be able to back off here and go to a much lower or higher permeability uh, product here so that we don't have the potential to trap, but it would be good enough to keep this from getting condensation in the winter. Again, a lot of nuances, a lot of things that have to happen just right for this to work, but it does have the potential to help this system a bit. One last little comment about this is, what were to happen if we just took this away entirely and simply insulated with the rigid board? This is a common practice, people like it, it can work. I would just say the caveat here is, this wall really has to be dry for this to be effective. At that point, then, this insulation, because of its thermal nature and its vapor properties, will slow down the outward vapor pressure, installed airtight, there won't be any air leakage behind it. We will prevent the house, if you will, from wetting the wall. If the wall's already dry, even though there'll still be some vapor transport or vapor drive to the indoors, especially below grade here, this is capable of slowing that up so that that vapor doesn't move on into the building, causing a building load or moisture potential on other surfaces here. Just bear in mind though, the one issue here is regardless how good we try, there is going to be moisture back here behind this system. So, and that only goes up as this foundation assembly is wetter and wetter and wetter. But even if it's a dry foundation, this is going to be 100% or 80 or 90% RH. There will be occasions where condensation will occur or water might accumulate, bulk water could accumulate. It's going to be a condition where we could have mold growth or other uh, things happening behind it. So in that event, what we have to do is seal the top so that vapor or any mold spores or anything can't get to the inside. And we have to carry this all the way to the floor and at the floor, we have to seal this joint. So any liquid water will drain behind and we won't allow air from the soil gases to get up into the building. Uh, we also want to limit that getting up behind the foam as well. So again, it can be done. It has worked in some instances where we have really good dry foundation conditions and really superb construction implementation you know, of the insulation strategy to be sealed, airtight, et cetera and carefully sealed to the floor and to the top. I think you can see the challenges with all these interior approaches. It's, it really just increases the risk of trapping moisture in the assembly. It increases the risk of mold growth. And it really points the way to why we started with the exterior insulation really is a much more robust, a much stronger approach. Uh, back to the issue of if we had a water event with this, we might also have to do some cleanup Found, uh, research uh, actually was in Canada on the Red River uh, when it we've had several floods there. When they had exterior insulation after the Red River floods and the basement was severely wetted, they were able to come in and simply clean, you know, do the appropriate cleaning measures, put some drying capacity in the foundation. The foundation wall took a little while to dry the inboard and everything was fine and dandy and everything was ready to roll. But anybody who had interior insulation had to get that system out of the way get everything cleaned up, get everything dried out. When they put it back, they stood a good chance that the soil was still saturated from the flood and it would re-wet re -wet, re the system. So again, that interior insulation is not only difficult to manage in best of conditions, it's extremely difficult if there were to be a, a water or a flood event. Another critical issue in high performance buildings is making sure we have a good slab. Uh, this would be true if it's a slab on grade, could even be conceivably in a crawl space, but let's focus on a basement foundation slab, which is real common practice. We want a number of things to happen. First of all, if we think about our moisture transport mechanisms, we have the two liquids. We have bulk water that 
can tend to accumulate below grade. It could come up under your building due, a, due to a rising water table. Any number of things why this could get wet by gravity or bulk water. We want to have large aggregate. This is shown as a sand bed, but it really should be an aggregate bed that allows for a horizontal transport of liquid water to either our drain tile through a weep system or to our sump basket so that that liquid water can get into that basket and be drawn out of the system and we'll keep liquid water from getting up against our finished slab. That rock aggregate bed, again if it's half inch or three quarter aggregate, finally uh, with all the fines removed, washed clean aggregate, it also serves as a capillary break. You can't get capillary action in large pores. So now this three to four inch aggregate bed is giving us the potential to control bulk water and reduce capillary wicking up into our slab. The two vapor transport mechanisms were air leakage and diffusion. We don't want air coming from down here that's going to be saturated air coming with vapor and potentially radon and other things, other soil gases coming up into the building. So we're going to seal joints, any penetrations, cracks. We'll have a sump here that is shown to be entirely sealed so that there's no way that air from down here can get into your home. That's really, really important. It's one of the main things we need to accomplish to get good moisture control and radon control below grade. The last vapor is diffusion. This is always wet at a high, very, very high vapor pressure relative to the building, and the vapor wants to come up into the building, in through the concrete, and into your home. By putting a vapor retarder under here, we will reduce the flow of that vapor up into the slab and ultimately protect the house from undue uh, moisture loads uh, or high indoor humidity in the basement. The last thing we really want to do is to get a thermal protection between our house and this cold soil. So in almost all cases, we'd always recommend some level of insulation. A little bit provides thermal comfort and thermal control on the slab. You might put more than this in there if you want to get higher performance or if you have in-floor heating or some other element, you would actually go to even thicker insulation. Because what you want to do is you want this slab to think it's in your house, not connected to the, to the cold soil. So that's the purpose of this thermal insulation is to isolate you from the cold soil, warm up the slab, that will keep the slab, warmer is always drier, so a warm slab is always going to be a drier slab. While we never recommend putting carpet on a slab, it's just not a good idea because it tends to make the slab colder, less heat from the house will get to the slab. A colder slab is a, is a wetter slab, it doesn't have the ability to get enough heat to keep it dry or to evaporate any moisture that might accumulate. So we don't recommend carpet on slabs ever, but clearly if you're even to entertain the thought of throw rugs and some things like that, putting this insulation underneath, isolating this slab from the soil, warming it up would give you the ability to put on you know, an occasional area rug or something like that. You could put cardboard boxes on the slab, even though that's not a good idea. You can put things down here and expect it to remain warm and dry and not end up with a moisture or mold problem. So these are really just very basic elements that any slab can do. It's not expensive, not challenging, as long as you understand the, the physics behind it. Really slick, click, uh, clear, easy guidelines to follow to end up with a basement slab that's going to be warm, dry, and healthy. All right, one of the critical issues here really is thinking about when you're picking a foundation insulation strategy is the cost. And clearly there's been some resistance to go to exterior systems because they at first appear to be more costly. Well, keep in mind, a wall really should be waterproofed in the first place, even though in the past we have used damp proofing or less expensive means. They really all should have waterproofing. So that cost really can't be associated with the exterior approach because you would need it for the interior as well. The cost of the insulation is certainly there. These tend to be, whether it's a rigid fiberglass uh, drainage board or a foam, uh, extruded polystyrene foam board, some of these have drainage built into them as well. Those materials undoubtedly will be more expensive thermal insulation than, let's say, a fiberglass bat. The real concern with above grade has been how to get the transition and cover this appropriately from physical abuse. So I'd say for a builder, that's the number one issue is how to make this transition. And today we really have good techniques to cover this easily uh, on, on either a flat, full basement, or even with a sloped grade. Uh, we can come down, insulate down with inlet furring strips, 
put on a protective coating that looks nice and is attractive and will protect the insulation uh, into grade. So that technique now has been pretty well developed, recognized, it works, it adds a little cost, it adds a little bit of labor to do that, adds a little bit of forethought as to how you're going to bring that on down from the siding uh, through to your a foot or so below grade. But let's think about the flip side of this. That does sound expensive and there's some sequencing issues. What we're comparing it to is an interior solution often that really doesn't work. It's very, very labor intensive to make that system actually work from a thermal and a moisture perspective. And it has higher risk of failure, condensation buildup, or if there's a bulk water problem, or we have a water event or a flood, that's going to be an incredibly system to undo or fix. So I think in the end, if, if you think beyond just the cost of the thermal insulation, this versus a bat, and think about the entire system cost, that bat's actually quite expensive to get installed properly and has these higher potential for callbacks or other risks associated with it. So in the end, I think the thermal insulation isn't even that big of issue. One of the last remaining things is most people like to finish their basement or have a finished look to their basement and they want to put drywall. That's why the interior system frequently is used. Is people can visualize putting drywall up there and having a finished space. But in reality, this system can be finished just as easy or faster by simply adding framing. You've got room for your wall outlets, putting a paperless drywall surface on the inside, holding it up three quarters to an inch off the, off the floor to reduce any capillary wicking. By using paperless, we've taken away some of the potential for mold growth. Leave that wall entirely open. There's, there's no need to insulate it or put any additional vapor retarders or anything like that. Put it with a semi-flat uh, latex paint, which means it can dry, and you'll end up with a finished looking basement with a very low cost. Uh, and again, that plus this is probably not going to be much more expensive than doing the other system that has all the potential for callbacks or future uh, potential problems that you might have to deal with. So we're working on the outside, really what we want is we want a very continuous solid water protection membrane. It's going to stop bulk water from getting in and it's going to slow down the vapor uh, to the inside. The second thing is we ideally want our thermal insulation system out there and it could be a semi-rigid fiberglass, it could be an extruded panel, something like this. But the third thing that really is nice here is to make sure we have good vertical drainage. We want to try to limit the water either in the system or the water that could get to our waterproofing membrane, bulk water control. So this is a rigid fiberglass panel that has that drainage. These are oriented layers of fiberglass. The water comes in and follows those layers down to our drainage system. There are rigid board products that have a variety of systems, again, for insulating and through the grooves and the filter fabric, uh, allow that water to come in and drain vertically to our uh, drainage system below. There are also other products that can be used that are added to the insulation scheme where we would put that on. That would give us, again, a water protection because this has to have the low vapor uh, permeance. It gives us a drainage channel and very tight soils. This could give us very positive vertical drainage to our drain and then insulation could be added in front of it or behind it. But in any case, we're trying to encourage this drainage. This is simply a smaller version of that to make sure we can get this bulk water away from our foundation and away from our thermal insulation system, get it to the drain tile where it'll be picked up either with a drain to daylight or a drain to our sump and be ejected from the system. Yeah, one of the really important parts of a basement or foundation design strategy is thinking about this rim joist. We know this rim sees the basement. We know this rim can basically seize the foundation and the moisture kind of the foundation. And depending how it's insulated, obviously is also impacted by what's happening outside. Could be cold in the winter, could be wet in the summer. So we want to basically come up with a strategy for this rim joist that will put it in the best and most favorable spot. The traditional insulation has been to install bats in some fashion in the rim. That makes a very vulnerable rim. First of all, bat insulation is not airtight or vapor tight, so we have to figure out a way to seal it off with a panel, in this case this is the long side of the building, you have to come up with a technique to prevent vapor from the house and getting out. We have to protect, uh, protect from air leakage from the building getting out, carrying moisture out. 
we have to protect from the moisture from the foundation coming up and into that rim, that's a very risky rim joist assembly. A little less risky is to basically insert foam panels into the rim. It's vapor tight, airtight, assuming we caulk around it properly and seal around it properly. So we have limited wetting from the inside. We have limited connection to the foundation because it's back set into the rim. So there is the ability for the foundation to dry, if you will, to the house rather than to wet up into that cold uh, rim joist. So that's a much safer application. But even safer yet is to move around and put the insulation on the outside of the rim so that again, now the rim is indoors, it's running warm, it's running dry, it's thermally isolated from the outdoors. If there are moisture issues out here, we also have the resistance of this for that moisture to move into the rim assembly, assuming we have proper water management, water drainage, uh, weather resistive barrier, etc. This is, and this is also going to protect this rim from any incidental foundation moisture and that again that foundation insulation, uh, moisture can come up and be relieved or dried to the space rather than getting trapped into our rim joist assembly. So this is a very robust, much less risky technique for insulating this very important part of the building. Again, I'm showing a fairly thin amount here. Most rim assemblies you'd want to be at least to an R10, two inches of XPS or perhaps two inches of a, a polyiso would get you up to an R15. That'd be a much better, a much more appropriate R value. The other thing you can do if this gets big enough and you're working for very high performance is you could put a small amount of insulation to the inside without compromising this rim because you have so much insulation and protection to the outside. You could add some thermal resistance to the inside without compromising the temperature or the moisture condition of your rim. One of the applications that's common today is to think about could we address this foundation wall with a spray foam application. It really goes back to the basics. This is only going to be suitable if this is an incredibly, extremely dry foundation from capillary wicking, from bulk water, and from inward bound water vapor, meaning we need a water protection membrane, uh, et cetera, on the outside. Assuming this is really dry, it is possible to spray foam up that wall and another advantage, presumably, is that you could wrap up over the top of the wall and into the rim joist and you get a continuous thermal insulation and a continuous air barrier and a material that is manipulating or slowing the vapor to some extent. While theoretically all possible, there's some real challenges to this. There's, we have to worry about bonds to the foundation wall. We have to obviously worry about the, how dry the foundation really is. And what can happen here is if that foundation isn't in fact dry enough, all of that moisture that's behind the insulation now in a very cold and damp condition, uh, uh, not enough energy moving through the insulation to move it into its vapor state and into a drying condition, is that moisture can move upward. Some will probably go out above grade, but we have the risk of that moisture being pushed up and accumulating in the rim joist itself. Uh, and so that's a, that's a concern, and, and uh, I'm not saying that spray foam interior application might not work. We just have to be very, very concerned about the details. Uh, one of the details is this brake right here. If, in fact, this could be lifted up, capillary brake could be inserted, uh, a moisture brake, if you will. That would prevent the moisture that's here from migrating up into the rim assembly. But that's an expensive proposition on an existing home, and even for new construction, it takes an extra step. So I think it's just fair to say, again, it has many of the same concerns that interior insulation has uh, regarding how wet this foundation is and what's going to happen over time with the foundation condition. Some folks will come in, let's say we have our foundation insulated to the outboard even, might choose to spray foam the rim. Again, it gives us a pretty good thermal performance per inch, if you will. It gives us air tightness, gives us some vapor resistance. And it's probably a pretty good strategy for rim joists because this is a difficult assembly to seal uh, from the interior. The, ch the, the challenge or the caution here is just not go too thick or too big. The thicker that gets, the more potential it has to connect this rim to the uh, foundation wall. So effectively try to keep it a little thinner. Uh, that gives you some drying potential. Does reduce the, you know, does give you a little bit of heat transfer to, uh, to protect the rim itself. Again, interior strategy is generally slightly more risky. That's probably the least risky of the choices than an exterior. But I encourage folks to think about how to get that extra insulation in. And again, we, 
you could come back and put a small additional spray foam on the inside that would achieve your air tightness and increase your overall thermal resistance a little bit.